Good morning, everyone. We are continuing the offering for the Ukraine. Uh, we ask you to give generously towards that. You may say our church is only a little drop in the bucket and it's a great big major problem. If you stop to think about it, if everybody sticks in a drop, not only this church, but other churches, pretty soon you have the bucket full. So uh, let's work towards that end, because certainly it is a needy area at this time. And we'll be sending money to them, I'm assuming, this week? Yes. Okay. It'll, it'll continue as well, but, but this week is going to be the first time it's done. Okay, and we encourage you to be here for Sunday School. We continue in the adult class a discussion of Calvinism versus Arminianism. Uh, the depravity of man is what we talked about this week. I encourage you to be here for that. It's a great learning experience. Also, on Wednesday at noon is release time. Club Jam is at 6 o'clock for our young people. Jam stands for Jesus and Me. Uh, 6.30 is the adult Bible study, and we will be continuing the story of hope. We have now finished the history part of it, and we'll be talking about things yet to come, which should be some interesting discussion for us. And once we're done with that, which will be another couple weeks at least, I'm guessing, we'll be going into the Truth Project. And if you'd like to be part of that, please let me know so to make sure we have enough material for you. Also, 7.30 for Lyft for our young people. Now, coming up on Thursday at 1.30 is the adult Bible, no, it's the ladies' Bible study. But they're also adults, so that's at Kathy Lee home, okay? <laughs> Saturday is the spring luncheon for the ladies. Encourage you to keep that in mind. Encourage you to invite people to come to that. And Kathy, do you... Okay, so if you got that, Wednesday you can, they're going to be setting up the tables, so Thursday, Friday you can decorate your particular tables. That's the ladies' luncheon. I also have another sheet to pass around. It has to do with the Easter brunch, which we have every year for, for Easter, and Easter is on April 17th, but I've been asked to pass this around, and so I encourage you to sign up for that as well. We did make the decision to, uh, the, our help to the Ukraine is going through our conference. Um, our conference is called Converge and uh, our, have had a strong relationship with Ukraine ever since the breakup of the Soviet Union. And uh, they have uh, sister church programs and things, so our conference is very well connected through both churches and seminaries and the like in, the, in Ukraine. They're focused on a few different things. They're focused on trying to get the money into the hands of the Ukrainian people um, uh, there to provide heat and stuff in the, in the church buildings because a lot of those church buildings and schools are being used to house refugees. And so um, it's used for mainly for needs reaching out to refugees, people that are displaced from their homes at the moment. Um, I think it also, it, it also goes to helping uh, with travel, getting people moved from there off to so safe locations and out of the country as well. And then also uh, humanitarian supplies that they bring back from those borders with them. And so they've got, uh, uh, and our conference, it's one of the things I've always really appreciated is they're very well organized when it comes to these kinds of things. And so they have a lot of connections inside Ukraine and a lot of organization to be able to get the funds to them. And 100% of the funds go all the way to Ukraine. It's not using a part of it to handle administration fees and different things like that. 100% of it is going to the, to the Ukraine. So uh, thank you for your help in those ways. All right, as we pray together today, there's a, uh, several people that we want to be thinking of. Uh, Jacob Marty, as we continue to pray for him, as he's uh, dealing with uh, the brain tumor. There, there also is a, a fundraising dinner for him coming up next Saturday. And I don't know all the details about it. I don't remember, but there's posters all over town, if you can uh, happen to notice one of those. But uh, there's a fundraising uh, m meal for uh, Jacob coming up ne uh, next Saturday. Yes. They asked me if I would bake um, for it, and I said yes, not remembering that the legend that day. So I will be baking some, but if anybody wants to bake anything and bring it over, we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, they're going to have. 
Yeah, they're going to have baked goods that they're either pricing or auctioning off or however they're doing it. And, um, uh, yeah, so if you want to bake something, we're dropping some stuff off. So you can get it to us if you want to, and, and we'll drop it off, or you can do it yourself however, you, however you'd like. But, but if you'd like to contribute in that way, uh, that's, that's good as well. Also, let's be uh, a praise. Angie told me last week that things went very well with her sister's appointment, and it looks like maybe just adjusting some medication and stuff should solve her problems with her pain and difficulty with breathing. Um, then also I want to uh, continue. We're going to pray for again for Jonathan. I think his his mom, and uh, strained relationships that are there. So his mom and her husband. And then um, uh, let's keep in prayer Doug Trapp's grandsons. Remember, um, two of the two of the three Brody, who's ten, and Chase, who's five, were the two that that have uh, they have a, a neurodegenerative disease, a very rare disease. And uh, let's be praying. Do you have any updates on them? With that, no. Let's just be uh, let's be praying praying for them. And then Samson's also a brother there too. But um, so far, from what I understand, he's in the clear. Um, so let's be praying for that. And then we're going to pray for uh, Carolyn Sahid today as well, and uh, and Steve's shoulder. So let's let's pray for these things, shall we? Our Father, we're thankful. Thankful for this day and the opportunity that we have to be gathered with one another and with you. And Lord, we're, we're thankful for this time of year. And we're thankful for the warmer weather and the melting snow. And, and um, we're thankful for the, even the reminder that we can get from that of how you melt away the hardness of our hearts and to draw us to yourself. And we're grateful for that. Father, we do uh, pray for these uh, people that are going through a number of struggles, we're thankful that even as we sang earlier that we have a God that is worthy to be praised both when things look like they're going wonderful for us and and then also when we're not sure exactly how they're going when things look confusing or hard. Um, we're thankful that you are present and working within us in all of those circumstances. Father, we do uh, celebrate and thank you for, for Carrie and, and her uh, uh, good prognosis at the doctor, and we just pray that they'd be able to get the medic or medication changed a little bit or whatever's required there to be able to uh, help with uh, with her breathing and, and her pain levels. Father, we think of, of Jacob this week as, as he's uh, uh, dealing with that the brain tumor, and, and God, we just we pray for healing. We pray that you'd give wisdom to doctors and surgeons and and uh, we thank you for the opportunity to reach out to Jacob. We do pray that his fundraiser would go well this week, too, that would help to meet and supply the needs that he has. Um, Father, we think of, of Jonathan. and Thank you for, for the Holtes and their family. And we just uphold his mom and in prayer and, and, and pray that you'd work in, in her heart and in her husband's heart. And, and uh, just that the, some of the relationships there that are somewhat strained, Lord, that, uh, that they'd find a way uh, for reconciliation and peace. And God, we thank you that you, uh, for your reconciliation that you provide for us in, in uh, uh, bringing us into a good relationship with you. Father, we uh, also pray for these little boys. Lord, I think of Brody and Chase and... and uh, Doug Trapp's grandsons. I just I just pray for them, Lord, with this uh, rare disease that they have. I pray that that uh, you would bring healing to them, uh, Father. I pray that that you'd take it away. Uh, I pray that if it's not in your will to do that, I pray that you'd give the doctors wisdom and insight. I pray maybe that a cure would be found that would help not only them but others. Uh, but Father, we just pray that you'd be with them and with their parents, with their with their brother. And, and uh, that you'd work in, in that situation. Father, I also think of Carolyn Sahid, and we continue to pray for her in dealing with, uh, with the condition of her liver and her kidneys. And, and uh, God, we just pray that with this doctor that she originally had, looking back into it, that you'd give the wisdom and stuff that's needed there. We pray for her healing with her situation as well. Pray for Sam and her kids uh, during this time also, as this uh, has got to be very stressful for a family. And we just pray that you would uh, uh, work in their hearts at this time as well. Lord, in all these situations, we pray that you'd use these things to, for uh, people's good, to, for, um, for your own glory. 
and for their good, that you'd use these things to draw people to yourselves, so that they can experience also the salvation that you provide, or if they've already experienced that, then to, to help them to grow to a deeper understanding of who you are in their relationship with you. Now, Father, we pray uh, also for Steve. I think of him and his, his shoulder as he recovers from that, and, and I pray that at the end of this recovery time that that his shoulder would feel strong and that he'd able, be able to do the things that he needs to be able to do at work and at home. And so, Father, uh, we just pray for your, your blessing upon him as well. Now, Lord, we pray that you'd bless our time together here this morning as we open your word together, that you would teach us, uh, illumine our hearts, that we might see clearly the truths of your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray it. Amen. All right, let's take, our, uh, let's take our Bibles out, and we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> and we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 11. We just barely touched on, uh, on this last part of the passage last week. And so that's kind of, we're going to get our, get our focus here today. Now to do that, I think we'll begin our reading from first, all the way back from verse 1. So let's begin our reading. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1 says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast the word I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. You know, the... the the Christian faith is different from any other religion in the world and, and in a number of ways. Uh, one of the ways that it is different is, is in its approach. Uh, we're saved not by our works or by what we achieve or by being more good than bad and that kind of a <laughs> breakdown, but we're actually saved by the grace of God as a gift and with only faith as a requirement. But in the way that we look at it today, there's another way that the Christian faith is different than any other religion in the world, and that is that it's not based on a philosophy. Right? Pretty much as you look at all the other religions of the world, they're based on a philosophy or an, or an understanding. Now, I wouldn't say that Christianity doesn't contain a philosophy, but it's not the pivotal point. It's not the, the main foundation that Christianity is established on. Christianity definitely has teachings about what things you should be doing and what things you shouldn't be doing and what things are true and what things are not true. And so there is definitely a philosophy to it, but it all starts in one place and it's all rooted actually in a historical event. You see, the other religions of the world are very different from that. Buddhism, Hinduism, these things are primarily a philosophy. It's not really what you believe about the, the people that originated the, those religions. Um, it's more of a, a philosophy of, of how the world works and, and your part in it and where you fit into that. And it's, it's all a philosophy. But with Christianity, it's not about that. It's about a historical event that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and rose again from the dead. It's based on the reality of that happening at one point in history. Now, kind of the awesome thing about that is it, it puts it on a pedestal where it can be evaluated. 
right? Because like Buddhism and those kind of things, it's, it's not that you can look at them and say, well, did these things happen or didn't they? It's really more, do you agree with that philosophy? Do you think that philosophy is right or don't you think that philosophy is right? Christianity puts it all down to this one thing. It is all either true or false based on one thing. Did this happen? And that's a pretty great thing because what it does is it, it gives us a tremendous amount of confidence. In fact, that I, I, find, I find that if I ever struggle with, with doubts or anything, is this, is this really true? Is this really where I should be living my life, investing my life? I got a lot writing on this. If, is, is this really true or am I just kind of fitting into something, I'm being, believing this because I was taught this or because I was born in this culture or whatever? I always come back to this one thing and this one thing settles the deal for me all the time. Did Christ actually rise again from the dead? Now the apostles in the early church clearly placed it at the very center of everything that they did. It was the very center of the early church. We see that as we look through the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the history book for the early church. We find right away in the book of Acts uh, when Pentecost hasn't even happened yet, the Holy Spirit hasn't come down on everybody yet, and the apostles are doing what they were told by Jesus. Jesus told them, you guys just wait here, wait in Jerusalem until the promised Holy Spirit comes, until you receive power from that. Then you're going to be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the whole world. Well, in the meantime... They're kind of locked away in an upper room hiding because they don't want to be caught by the authorities, end up being put on a cross like Jesus was. And so they're kind of uh, hiding away from society at this time. And they say, you know what? What are we going to do while we're waiting? Let's, uh, let's replace Judas. They quoted a scripture in the Old Testament about somebody else taking Judas's place, which there's a little bit of debate about whether they were supposed to replace him or whether the Apostle Paul would be the one to replace him. But we'll leave that debate alone for now. And so they're sitting there and they say, you know what? Judas fell like the scriptures of the Old Testament said he would. And so we ought to replace somebody to replace him. And so they decided to do that. Now, this was the qualifications. In Acts 1, 20, verses 21 and 22, it says, So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. So notice what's happening here. They say, we're going to replace Judas. Um, there's other people that have hung around. In fact, they narrow it down to two. They said there's at least two guys that have been with us the whole time. All the way from back at the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he was baptized by John. All the way up till now. And through now, seeing his death and his resurrection. There's two we got to pick from between these two people to replace Judas. So the qualifications were they had to be around for everything in Jesus' ministry all the way up to this time. But what was the intent? Why were they... In other words, that was the past. What was the future? The future is at the very end of that verse. One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. You see, the apostles saw their primary job moving forward as being a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4, we find the same thing, a similar thing, that this is what, now in Acts chapter 4, the Holy Spirit has come. That's recorded in Acts chapter 2. And so they stand up and proclaim the gospel, and the church starts to grow by the thousands. And when you get to Acts chapter 4, they're getting in trouble. Because the local authorities, the Jewish leaders, do not like this idea of the resurrection of Christ because they're the ones that had him put on the cross and so the resurrection of Christ from the dead means a lot of trouble for them and so they're trying to get rid of it well in Acts chapter 4 the first four verses says and as they were speaking to the people the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. 
And so at this point, the church has already grown. Can you imagine that in just a short time, up to 5,000 people testifying to the resurrection. But why were they upset? Because they were teaching the resurrection. And a little bit later in the same chapter, in verse 33, it says, And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Later on, in chapter 23 of the book of Acts, this is later, the apostle, by this time the apostle Paul has come to Christ, and he uh, is arrested, and he's standing before the authorities, and this is, this is what happens. It says, Now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, so they're before a secular leader. And the people bringing the charge were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now the Pharisees and Sadducees were like, if you add some religion to it, it's like the Democrats and the Republicans of the United States of America. They can't seem to... to come together on anything except for one thing they've been able to do is come together to get rid of Jesus. They didn't like Jesus. They wanted to get rid of him. So they're able to come together to get rid of him. Now they're trying to come together to get rid of the Apostle Paul, but they have a lot of things that they don't agree on. One of them was a resurrection. Pharisees believed in a resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees don't believe in a resurrection of the dead. And so these two groups are coming together to try to complain against Paul to the council or to the leadership. And Paul, it says, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee. It is with respect to the hope of the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. Well, as soon as he did that, (laughs) then the fight between the Pharisees and the Sadducees broke out. And all of a sudden, the Pharisees, the Sadducees wanted him, <laughs> wanted him punished. And the Pharisees, oh, no, no, if this is about the resurrection, then we can't go there. We weren't going to give up any ground on the resurrection. And so the whole thing, thing kind of began to dissolve. But the point is, the apostles, right from their beginning of continuing Christ's ministry, how did they view their job? It was all about the resurrection. It's about the fact that Jesus died on that cross for us and that he rose again from the dead it was to this and this is just a small sample of the verses that you can find the passages that you can find scripture that testify to the same thing that the resurrection of the dead is the pivotal truth of christianity prove it and you've proven christianity disprove it and you've disproven christianity many people have recognized that and tried to do exactly that i think of Josh McDowell set out, he thought he was going to take down Christianity by disproving, showing the resurrection to be a hoax. Today he's in ministry. Um, Lee Strobel did the same thing. He, his wife became a Christian and he didn't like what she was, she was starting to change their life and he didn't like it. So he thought, I'm just going to show my wife that, um, that, that this, is a, this is a hoax and the, so we can get life back to normal. He was an investigative uh, r- journalist from... Uh, it was a Chicago Tribune, I think it was. And uh, so he started traveling all around the world, interviewing the experts. Well, today he's in ministry too. Um, uh, another guy set out, he actually highly respected Christ. Uh, Morris thought highly respected Christ, but he, um, he just thought there was too much stuff added around it, miraculous stuff added around it later. And so he dug into it to try to find the real Jesus and point people to the real the real Jesus, not as necessarily a religious symbol, but just as an honorable person of history that we should understand. He ended up, the uh, first chapter of his book is called The Book That Refused to Be Written, <laughs> and uh, he wrote Who Moved the Stone instead, arguing for the historicity of the resurrection of Christ. Um, there's, oh, who was it? Byerly, I think his name was, it wrote Sur- Surprised by Faith. Um, he didn't really see Christianity as anything relevant he thought you can't it's nothing you can prove or disprove it's just irrelevant he ended up writing a book called surprised by faith as he found the facts to be very different um i think also of uh Moncaster. Moncaster was a guy that he was an atheist and he loved to get in arguments with christians because a lot of christians don't know how much supporting detail is there is that actually upholds their faith and so he liked getting into arguments with christians about things and and he was an evolutionist until he ran into one that actually had some answers for him and they pointed him in a direction which he 
followed, thinking he would disprove that as well. And he ended up writing a couple of books. Um, a Skeptic's Search for God is his first one, uh, where he found that he, being very skeptical of any religion at the beginning, actually recognized the truth of the resurrection of Christ and put his faith in him as well. And so many have tried to take on the resurrection, disprove it down through history, and to no avail. Not every one of them ends up becoming a believer. Some become more hardened in their disbelief, but none has been able to offer even a remotely plausible, with the historical setting, even a remotely plausible scenario that could answer for the things like the empty tomb and the missing body and, and the testimony of the, the apostles and, and all of these things. In fact, the more recent ones that I've seen are people that just say, oh, something else probably happened. And they, they've lost interest in finding what could possibly happen and say, oh, probably anything else, almost anything else, but something else, not, just not that. And that, to me, is a huge cop-out because you have a whole historical scenario that you're just going to ig ignore and say, oh, no, it just didn't happen. Well, what did happen then? Oh, does, doesn't really matter. Well, that's what we're dealing with today, and the reason we are is because that's what the Apostle Paul was dealing with when he wrote to the Corinthians. And he, as we looked at last week, tried to confirm them in their faith and their understanding of the gospel. And now as he moves into this part of the passage, the way that he does that is by proving, offering up the proofs of the resurrection. Last week we talked about the content of the gospel being the death and the resurrection of Christ. And we mentioned that the burial was a confirmation of his death because that's who you bury, you bury dead people. And the resurrection was confirmed by the eyewitness testimony. And so the gospel is the death and the resurrection of Christ. But, you know, when you think about it, uh, something like a resurrection really should be provable. It really should be. If you're going to uh, ask people to believe in something like this, a resurrection from the dead, in fact, somebody's resurrection of himself from the dead after being dead for three days, um, that really should be looked at with some skepticism on the front end of it. But it's something that can be embraced with much optimism on the tail end of that investigation and that's exactly what God has allowed for us to have you see the reason Jesus did miracles the apostle John in his gospel the gospel of John always referred to or mostly referred to the miracles as signs God, the reason God gave miracles was so that they would they'd be signs signs point you to something point you to a truth right the road signs point you to a truth of a a curvy road that comes up ahead or a danger of falling rocks. We always used to see when you're driving through the passes in the Cascade Mountains or, or danger of slipperiness or, or a stop sign ahead or an intersection. Signs point to something. Well, that was the purpose of the miracles. The reason that Jesus did so many miracles was that was God's way of proving this is my son. The reason the apostles continued to do miracles as they built the foundation of the church was that's God's way of proving that these are the apostles of my son. And this which they are giving to you, revealing to you, is my word. This is the truth. Well, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the ultimate of those miracles. Now, it also accomplished, just like healing a Giving a blind guy sight also accomplishes something. It gives him sight. The resurrection of Jesus also accomplished something. It gives us life. His death pays for our sins. His life gives us the eternal life that we now have because those sins are paid for. So his resurrection from the cross accomplishes something, but it also acts as a sign. It also is there for proof to us that what we believe in is absolutely true. And the way, how can you do this? How can you prove it? It's not through DNA tests. It's not through the scientific method. But you know what? The scientific method isn't the only kind of proof. In fact, when you think of it, if you think of it from a judicial sense, if you go into a courtroom, if you go into the law, what kind of proof do they use in there? Well, sometimes they use scientific proof. They use DNA samples and, and stuff like that. Um, I was on a court case, a murder trial once, many years ago. 
and it drug out for a couple of weeks. And, and one of the things, you know what I was actually surprised about? I was surprised at the lack of scientific proof. Um, these guys, a couple of guys in a building, didn't seem like they were overly careful or overly sharp. And uh, they ended up killing an older lady that lived there. And I'm like, well, where's the, where's the guy that tells us that we got this guy's fingerprint on that door or this guy's this, this, this guy's drop of his sweat or a drop of blood or something like you always see on TV. There was remarkably absent from that trial. Now, I think when you do have it, I would imagine it's very valuable. But getting it, I think, is a different story. It's harder to do. But you know what? Uh, these guys are in prison today, or at least the one that was in the trial I was on are, is in prison today. He's in prison today for killing that elderly lady. But you know what? You know what gave us the proof? Testimony. What did the witnesses say? The other guys that were there, the, uh, the, the, other, the other things that you had to deal with as you put together the whole scenario. We don't have the time to go into all that. But you know what? When we're looking at the resurrection of Christ, we're not looking at, we're not trying to scrape DNA off of trying to find the old garments that he was buried in and all that kind of stuff, um, which you can probably find several copies of those out there that you can worship somewhere in the world. But um, it's not that kind of proof. But what is it? It's historical proof. It's eyewitness accounts. And that actually is the stronger of most of the things that we believe. That's the kind of substantiation that they have. Not any tests that are done in a lab, but what we find from people that were there. And that's exactly what we're seeing as we look at this resurrection proof that the Apostle Paul is leading us through. Now, as he does it, he's going to list these different witnesses, all these different people that, that witnessed this resurrection um, and we're going to look at, I'd like to focus on five characteristics of these credible witnesses. It's, it says, beginning in verse 5, Then he appeared to more than... Oops. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. Now, as we look through this list of, of witnesses, uh, we're going to find some different and uh, some interesting factors that makes them qualified or makes them credible witnesses to the resurrection of Christ. The first thing that I would like us to consider is the closeness, the closeness of these witnesses. These are witnesses that, as we pointed out back in, back in Acts chapter 1, these were people that had been with Christ for three and a half years of his ministry on earth that were there solidly with him. These were people that were there for his death. They were there for his resurrection. These were people that saw it. They were, they were eyewitnesses. And you know, that's what, that's crucial. You know, when you hear something from somebody that was at a certain event, you can have a pretty good measure of confidence, right? As long as that person is a trustworthy individual and they're relaying to you something that they saw themselves. Now, every step that you take away from that, you maybe you lose a step, right? If this person saw it, but you're getting it from this person who got it from that person, all right, now we'd start to get a little bit more disconnected. But in the resurrection of Christ, that's not what we have. We have a bunch of firsthand eyewitness reports that tell us exactly what happened. We have four different gospels that four different people tell us what their experience of that time was. We have the Apostle Paul that tells us what his later confrontation with Christ, risen from the dead, what that was like. And so we have all these people that were close to, that saw Christ, talked to him, ate with him, touched him after he had been put to death. And so they were close to it. And not only that, but not only even just looking at the closeness of the apostles and these people that are listed here, um, the early believers, the early church. You realize that the early church first got started and took off and grew rapidly right in Jerusalem. 
which is right where the resurrection would have happened. Now, if the resurrection didn't really happen, that would be the hardest place to start the church. If the resurrection didn't really happen, you're better off trying to start the church somewhere a ways away where nobody knows the exact events. With Christ being crucified, with all the multitudes that were gathered to listen to him teach, and, and then him going through this crucifixion and people out in the streets yelling crucify him, and all the events in that week that led up to it, this would have been something that was known all over Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. And that's exactly where the church takes off and immediately grows by thousands of people. If it didn't really happen, the community would have been like, what are you talking about? They wouldn't have bought it at all. Now, now in Acts chapter 2, we see that very visibly. Acts chapter 2, it's the, it's the day of Pentecost. They're celebrating Pentecost, which is a Jewish festival uh, held at the temple. And the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles and these miraculous signs happen along with it. And then after that, uh, Peter gets a chance to preach because everybody takes notice. Again, it's a big event. Everybody takes notice. They're like, what in the world's going on? And Peter gets to stand up and tell them what it's all about. And in the midst of that, he says to them in verses 22 through 24, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to, attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, Notice that. Peter says, look, this Jesus of Nazareth, who was attested to you by God. In other words, he's telling these people, look, you saw the miracles. That was God's stamp of approval on Jesus. And you guys were witnesses of it because it happened to him in your midst. And then he says, he's able to tell them, you yourselves know this. He's, he's talking to a group of people. He's like, you, you guys saw this. You guys heard his teaching. You guys saw the miracles. You guys... And then he goes on, crucified him. He says, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God, but God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And so Peter takes this group of people and he says, look, you guys know this. All these things happened right in the middle of you, right in your midst. You know it and you saw it and you crucified him. Now, if there's any group on the face of the earth that does not want the resurrection to be true, it's these people. Right? These people were obviously the people that were standing outside of Pi uh, palaces, palaces, Pilate, Pilate's palace, yelling, crucify him, crucify him, to get Pilate to finally cave in and crucify Christ. So these are the people that are going to feel ultimately responsible for the death of Christ. Now he's telling them, you guys, all this happened in your midst, you knew full well, and you killed him. These are, these are people that they are vested in this. They do not want the resurrection to be true. Well, he goes from there to quote scripture. He looks back in the Old Testament, quotes from David. He says, for David says concerning, concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let my, yet let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Now, notice David says something in that passage. He says one of the things to God. He says, you will not um, abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. In other words, God's not going to let him go to, go to the grave and his body to decompose. And so the Apostle Peter argues from that. He says, brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. So in other words, David's body is still in the grave and it is decomposing. So he couldn't have been talking about himself. He says, being therefore a prophet, 
And knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. And so Peter quotes back to the Old Testament, says, look, David wasn't talking about himself because we know his body is decaying and has been decaying in that grave for some time. His grave is still with us, guys. David was looking forward to Jesus Christ and that he would go into the tomb, but he would come out in three days and he would not decay. He would overcome life. He was teaching us about the resurrection. So then here's this group of people absolutely does not want the resurrection to be true because they're the ones who killed Christ. Lived right in the place where Jesus did the bulk of his miracles. Saw them take place. We're aware that the apostles are teaching the resurrection of Christ. So what is this group's response going to be? Well, the response is in verses 37 and 38. It says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 41 records, So these who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. You see, in Jerusalem, the place where this happened among people that absolutely did not want this to have happened. All of a sudden, the church gets its very first bump of growth and it's 3,000 people. That is a strong, strong witness to the truth of the resurrection. The Apostle Paul also would point that uh, other people in that same direction when he gets toward the end of his ministry and when he's, uh, when he's arrested. Uh, you know where it doesn't pose quite as, see quite as much of a growth? Uh, among the Gentiles, not as much. When the Apostle Paul would go to, from place to place on his missionary journeys, he'd always go into the synagogues first and testify to the resurrection of Christ. And then uh, if they, when they rejected him, then he would go and reach to the Gentiles. They always kind of tried to start with that basis among the Jewish people that were looking forward to the resurrection. The Gentiles, they saw a lot of converts among the Gentiles too, but we don't tend to find specifically how many thousands joined the church this day or that day or after this sermon or that sermon. But um, we also find some skepticism. Right? In Acts chapter 17... Verses 18 through 20, it says some of the Epicurean, he's in Athens here. He's uh, uh, going to be at, a pl at the Areopagus, a place called Mars Hill. It says some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. As Paul came to Athens and he was preaching the gospel and the resurrection of Christ. And, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange thing to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Well, a little farther down the passage, because he's going to go into kind of quote some of their philosophers and things as well. But a little farther down the passage in verse 30, it says, The times of ignorance God overlooked. So the apostle is going to apply some of the truths he's just been teaching them. He says, the times of this ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And so when the Apostle Paul went to other places, what did he preach? He, he maybe didn't quote scripture, he quoted some of their philosophers. He spoke truths, but tried to connect it to those people. But you know one thing that didn't change is the resurrection was the key point of the message. Now when that happened, what did this group do? It says, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. You know what? It's interesting. It's interesting. The Apostle Paul is speaking to this group, not in Jerusalem, but clear over in Athens. 
they seem a little more reluctant to believe in the resurrection. Some of them just, as he started talking about the resurrection, kind of lost interest. But in Jerusalem, right, where it happened, amongst the people that actually were instrumental in putting him on the cross, the church grows instantly by thousands. In chapter 2, they're up to 3,000. Chapter 4, they're up to 5,000. The church is growing rapidly right where it happened. Well, the Apostle Paul, as he stands before, uh, before kings and, and governors, he ends up in Acts chapter 26. He's, uh, he's, before, um, he's before Festus at this time. Because what happens is Paul ends up getting arrested, and he gets handed over to a guy named Felix, was who was kind of a proconsul of the area. And Felix doesn't really know what to do with him. He listens to him from time to time. No real good accusation to do anything with him. So he just kind of leaves him uh, arrested for two years. Uh, Festus comes in and takes over for Felix, who gets moved out of the area. And Festus doesn't know what to do with him. He listens. Some of the Jewish leaders come up and, and place charges against Paul, but they're clearly not true. So he doesn't know what to do with him either. King Agrippa comes to visit Festus and his wife Bernice. And uh, Agrippa and Bernice come to visit Festus. And Festus says, you know what, I got this guy. I'm not really sure what to do with him. I asked him if he'd like to go back to Jerusalem and be tried there, and he said, no, my appeal's to Caesar. But I can't really send him to Caesar without knowing what he's guilty of. So why don't we take a look at him, and we'll both try to come up with whatever charges can be leveled against this guy to send him to Caesar with. And so they do that. Well, we'll get more into that in a little bit. But for right now, I'd like us just to focus on a couple things. When Paul gets to stand before Agrippa, and give his defense. He's excited about it. And this is why. He says, I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So the Apostle Paul says, you know what, Agrippa, I am excited to stand before you because I am aware of who you are, and I know that you are familiar with all these things. And so he finds great encouragement in that. Why? Because it's true. Because he's going to talk about the truth of the resurrection. Well, a little bit farther in the same passage, in fact, it's, it's kind of toward the end, still in chapter 26, verses 24 through 29, it says, As he was saying these things, and you'll see more of what he said later, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. But I am speaking true and rational words. For the, thing, for the king knows about these things. And to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has, been, has not been done in a corner. You see, the, the witness that these witnesses testify to, these are things that happened out in front of people. These were not things that were done in a corner. So... The witnesses of the resurrection were very confident in their testifying to the resurrection. The more truth, the more these things came out, the, the stronger their case. So we have closeness. They were close. In Jerusalem, they were close. The apostles were close. Uh, all these people, they were eyewitness accounts that is given to us. But not only is there closeness, there's character. And I just say just briefly that in, if you look through that list of names... These are people of strong character. These are people from other documents inside the New Testament. We find these people that uh, uh, are impeccable in their honesty and teaching others to be the same. If you think of what's contained in the apostles' writings, uh, Paul's and James and Peter's and John's, uh, they were people of high character and high moral standards. So in other words, these aren't people that are going to bend the truth to make something work out better for them. Um, not only is there character, but there is quantity. There's quantity. He lists, a, he lists a good dozen witnesses there at least. And then he says, at one occasion, there was over 500 people that witnessed Jesus risen again from the dead. Over 500 people. And he adds this statement. Most of whom are still alive though some have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep referring to death as the Bible often does. In other words, he's telling them, 
You don't have to take my word for it. You can go ask Peter. You can ask the 12. You can ask any one of 500 people that was there. Most of them are still around. Most of them are still alive. You know, even to us looking today, now can we go interview those 500 people? No. But this still is a hugely strong argument. You know why? Because we look at a document that was written to a group of people at a time where they could. And they believed. And so the quantity of these witnesses is amazing. You know, I've read different, uh, different books, different accounts by people that are involved in law enforcement, and stuff like that, and talk about the, the truth of the resurrection. And we, our prisons are full of people in there for all kinds of crimes on way less proof than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's people in there on the testimony of a witness or two. They had over, five, <laughs> over 500 that would testify clearly. So not only is there, there quantity, there's also, there's also confirmation because of the fact that they could check with those people and they were still alive, they were still uh, able to be interviewed and so there's confirmation of those facts. And then lastly, a credible witness is uh, one that, where we see change. Where we see change. The reason I mention this is because we see change take place that, that you can't really explain other than the resurrection of Christ. One of the changes that we see is that we see the cowards become courageous. Where were the twelve after Jesus was crucified? They were hiding. They were hiding in, a, in a, an upper room with the doors locked. They were now, I'm, by calling them cowards, I don't mean it necessarily to be demeaning. I want to state what they were experiencing, but I'm not saying I wouldn't be right there with them. I would have been locked in that room too at that point. I'm sure of it. And so I'm not trying to look down on them, but I want to recognize what happened. They were hiding. And then when they came out of hiding, they said, you know what? I'm going back to fishing. Going back to my old life. I'm, I'm... When Jesus catches them along the, the road to Emmaus and they're downcast about it he says what's going on and they said we thought this guy was the messiah but apparently we were wrong so they're they're kind of turning they're going away from it and then all of a sudden you see all 11 of them willing to die for one thing the resurrection any of them at the point of their Torture for John, who didn't end up dying. He ended up dying later, but he was tortured for not stopping to teach about the resurrection. But all of them could have gotten out of their torture, gotten out of the brutal deaths that they participated in, if they would have just said, you know what, we made it up. Which, what other, what other thing could there be? Either, either they made it up or they didn't. Either it's true or they made it up. Because they're the ones that spread it. And here's the other thing. They would have to know that they made it up. Because they're the ones saying, we saw him with our eyes. And so the only other op alternative is that they made it up. Now let me ask you, what do they have to gain? All it did was cost them a, to, say, to teach the resurrection and continue to teach the resurrection. All it did was give them a life of running from law enforcement while they tried to share the gospel with other people. All it did was give them a life of imprisonments, beatings, and death eventually. What made these people who said, you know what, never mind, I'm going back to fishing, who were hiding in that empty room, what made those people so courageous that they could be crucified or tortured and still not cave. Not only that, have you ever known a group of people that were in trouble for something that they did and not cave and say, okay, I did it to get a lesser <laughs> punishment? These guys had nothing to gain, everything to lose, unless the resurrection's true. Then they had a whole eternal life to gain by being faithful to the testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because then this world isn't the end of it. So we see cowards who become courageous. And not just one or two of them, all of them. 
were that courageous to the end. And then lastly, we see a com the combative becomes convinced. And this is obviously referring to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was trying to stamp out the early church. He was trying to, to get rid of Christianity. And he was there. He was there when they put other Christians to death. In fact, he said that he, he signed. In fact, it, we don't really have time for it, but let's go through it quickly, I guess. This first part of it we already read. When he gets to stand before Agrippa, and he's glad to do so because the king is familiar with these things. Then in Acts 26, verses 6 through 8, he says, And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain. And, and what is that? It's the resurrection of the dead. So the end of verse 8, he says, Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? And so the issue that, he, that they're dealing with here is the resurrection of the dead. And then he goes on to say, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, what kind of things did he do? He says, I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. We have recorded for us Stephen and a mention of James in the book of Acts. But other Christians, Christians were put to death for their faith in Christ. The Apostle Paul said, when that happened, I signed the paper as a witness against them. Remember when they stoned Stephen to death? The Apostle Paul was the one holding their coats, giving his assent to the death of Stephen because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that Stephen uh, proclaimed. Then he goes on to say, uh, and I punished them often in all the synagogues, and I tried to make them blaspheme, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So he said, I, I tried to get them to blaspheme. If you, if you say Christ didn't rise again from the dead, you can get out of this. But they wouldn't do it. And he says, not only in Jerusalem, I got permission from the authorities to go pursue them to other cities as well. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when, he had fall, when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to go to kick against the goads. And I said... Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But arise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. That's when Festus says to him, Paul, your much learning has made you mad. Now notice what Festus recognizes. This is a very learned individual. Festus knows Paul's background. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, the best school that they had. And the Apostle Paul, he basically says this, look, I was persecuting the church. I was arresting people. I was consenting to their death. I was trying to get people to blaspheme. I was not only doing it where I lived, but traveling from there. I went to Damascus in order to see these people locked up, put away, put to death, whatever it took to get rid of the church. And then in Damascus, I became a preacher of the gospel. In the passage that we have before us, how does he do it? For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. The one who was working so hard to stamp out Christianity ends up being writing a majority of the New Testament books. 
The biggest adversary of the church became the biggest proponent of the church. What happened? By his own mouth, he saw the risen Christ resurrected from the dead. You know, if you're going to try to shoot down the resurrection of Christ, you have to come up with what happened to Paul. You have to come up with what happened to Peter and the other 12 that were hiding. You know, when Peter followed Jesus to the trial and ended up where he was being tried to see whether he would go to the cross or trying to make it happen, Peter goes and he denies Christ three times to save his hide. Why later? Why later does he not do the same thing again? He's already shown himself to be able to deny Christ in order to protect himself. Why later does he refuse to deny Christ in order to save his own life? Because he knew that the resurrection was true. Why did the Apostle Paul, the biggest enemy of the church, became the big, become the biggest preacher of the gospel? Because he knew that the resurrection was true. And how? Should that knowledge of the truth, that proof of the resurrection, then impact our life? That's what we get to learn next week. Our Father, we're thankful. We're thankful for this day. We're thankful for all the confirmation, all the proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We're thankful for a host of eyewitness accounts. We're thankful for the the very existence of the church which speaks, testifies heavily to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We're thankful that, that you broke through the hardness of their heart and the people that were in the very place where the resurrection happened and people that had the, the most on the line saw clearly the truth that Jesus Christ is risen again from the dead. And Father, we're thankful because we know that in that resurrection, we too have life. It's in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and take our